Hallelujah. The Lord is here. He is here. And he's worthy to be praised. Let's just open up our hearts and let's thank God for the goodness that he has shown us. For the opportunity to give. For us to be able to stand in his presence and just honor him. Thank you, Lord.
Come on, tell him that he's worthy this morning. He's worthy. Hallelujah. Oh, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. Come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. He's holy. He's a mighty God. Holy. Magnificent, awesome, no one set apart. Our Lord is holy. Our Lord is holy. Yeah. Our Lord is holy. Oh. Our Lord is holy. Now sing with me. With me, come on. Holy, 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 holy. With the angels worship. Holy, 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 holy. In heaven they sing holy. Holy, 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 holy. Put your hands together this morning. Come on, one more time, one more time. Our God is worthy. I said our God is worthy. Mighty in battle. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything in you praise the Lord. Everything in you. Let the Lord, oh my soul, and forget not His benefits. Somebody give the Lord a big shout. Hallelujah. I stand. I stand. I stand. I stand in love of you. I stand. For the next one minute, I want you to hold your neighbor's hands. This is a very important moment so that we lift each other up in prayer. We don't know what the person you are holding, you don't know what they've been through. 
they, they are looking good. They are happy, but we don't know the type of warfare going on in their lives. So for the next one minute, I want you to just pray over them. Lift them. Encourage them. Come on. Open your mouth. Begin to pray over them now. Pray over them. on pray for their health pray for their financial breakthrough pray for their families pray for their business pray for their ministry come on lift them up lift them up in prayer that them and their children and their children's children will see the goodness of the Lord and the land of the living that they will not die until they have fulfilled the purpose of the Lord Come on, raise your voice. Raise your voice. Raise your voice. Raise your voice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless you, Lord. Jesus. Hallelujah. How many of you can say in such a glorious presence of the Most High God this morning? Amen. Do we have at least a hundred people in the house expecting God to do something big? My God, I can sense such a move of God today. I came today to hear what the Lord has to say regarding my life. Somebody say, I am ready. Come on one more time. I am ready. Amen. Remain standing for the next one minute. I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Nevers Mumba. I met him in 19, about 1990. That's about 28 years ago. My, my uncle, I, I see my cousin is back there. Beatrice, wave, wave at me, my sister over there. Somebody say hi. So, so my, my cousin and, and, and I and, and her family, we moved from, from Mansa to Kitwe. And then we move into, you know, we come from Mansa. It's a very small, uh, uh, very small city. And then we move to Kitwe, which is, which is big. You know, it's nice. And then we move into this house, uh, which is like a duplex. So it's like two houses, but they are connected together. And then I remember the address up to now. It's 808A, Harrow Crescent. I remember up to now. And so we move in there. And so we're just excited. And, uh, you know, when you move into the house, the kids, they start, you know, picking the bedroom. So I, um, I went to the master's bedroom and I said, this is going to be my bedroom. And my aunt said, that's the master bedroom. Because when you come from Africa, the master bedroom is the only bedroom with the toilet and the bathroom. So my aunt says, can't you see it's got a bathroom in there? So my uncle stands over me and says, this bed is too big for me. Joseph, you take it. So watch this. Watch this. The next day, so I have no idea who Nevers Mumba is. 1990 or 1991, one of the two. So the next day we are outside and I see a team of people come in. And this man who had a radiance on him, he had a white polo t-shirt. He showed up with a bunch of people and then he came to me and said, is your dad here? There was this... His tongue wasn't like a typical African. <laughs> you know, because when, when, when Africans, when we talk, we talk. There was something, there was a smooth, but, but there was something about him that took my attention. That's why I remember the year, I remember what he was dressed up. And he says, I am never Smumba. And you hear his unique voice. And he says, we are here to pick up the swing. And so they, they picked it up and loaded it in the truck and then they went. And after he left, that evening I... We turn on the TV and there is the man preaching on television that just came to our house. Right? At, at the time, I believe he was one of, if not the most popular preacher in the sub-Sahara. Right? That night, I don't know what I was thinking, but in my bedroom, 
I said, Lord, that man used to sleep here. I said, wherever you have taken him, I want to go there. I said it. I said it. Either 1990 or 1991. And so it wasn't a shock that in 2004, I ended up at Christ of the Nation where he was. Where he was. Now, he went on to become the vice president of the nation of Zambia, which I just found out from his assistant, he introduced him, that according to the president that he worked with, he was the best vice president Zambia has ever had. Ever had. He has multiple churches. And he was mentored by the legendary Reinhard Bonke. He shared a story with us yesterday how Reinhard Bonke imparted him with the Holy Ghost power to do wonders, signs, and miracles. So today, we are not just talking about a regular man from the motherland. We are talking about a man after about 35, 36 years of him preaching. The gospel has proved that it's real and it works Amen. in his life. Woo! Ladies and gentlemen, yes. I want us to give Dr. Never Smumba, Vice President, a GFC welcome. Come on, give him a God bless you today. Our Heavenly Father, this morning, we decrease that you may increase. I decrease that you may increase. I would ask of you this morning, Heavenly Father, to open the windows of heaven. Allow the rain of the Holy Spirit to descend upon us. I present myself before you asking that you anoint now these lips of clay as I endeavor to break the bread of life. I ask that, Lord, as the heavens open, just like everybody else here, Lord, I also open my heart. As you touch them, touch me. As you heal, heal me. As you prosper them, prosper me. As you lift them, lift me. For this word shall never return to you empty. But it shall accomplish the purpose for which it has been sent. I thank you for your presence. I give you praise and I ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people shouted amen. amen. All of God's people shouted amen. amen. Why don't you try to shout like Zambians would? All of God's people shouted amen. amen. God bless you. May be seated in God's holy presence. It's good to be in the house of God this morning. And uh, I just love it when I come into the sanctuary and have no clue what God is about to do. Except I'm expectant. So really, if you've come here with a lot of doubt saying, we wonder what a politician can say, I am not going to wait for you to figure that out. I'm just going to go straight into this thing because I'm here on an assignment. Amen. And I know that some of you might miss your moment by just trying to figure out, can a, past, can a politician really preach? Can a politician really bless me? You may go on that journey, you are on, you are on your own. Because I'm right here because there's only one king of kings. The Bible actually says, the Bible actually says every knee, including presidents, prime ministers, vice presidents, bishops, apostles, every knee shall bow at the mention of the name of Jesus. So today, whatever challenge you face about who can preach and who can preach, just, just deal with that because right now we are in his presence Amen. and listen I may be a politician but if God can use a donkey because a yes. donkey one time Woo! spoke yes. when God just decides to use somebody I, I, somebody told me I was actually more handsome than a donkey so give me some credit okay if God can use a donkey Woo! let's just accept that he can use a politician Amen. is that alright Praise the Lord. Listen, just stay where you are for a few minutes. I'll chase you when time comes. But I'm so delighted to be here today. And I just want to flow with the spirit. I, I'm glad that some of my team is here. Some of my 
young people and that are no longer young, you know, when you're a father, children are always children. Then you discover they have got their own children. So you have to try to train yourself to that. Yes, they are sons, but they are fathers and, and, and mothers. But today I'm accompanied by friends of mine. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce my special assistant, uh, Clement. Um, as you are aware, I do both politics and church. And Clement is my special assistant in both because uh, he can preach uh, if, if there is a crisis. Uh, that's what assistants are for, not, not just to carry your bag. I mean, they should be able to assist. Uh, when I fail to preach because of something, he needs to step in and finish the sermon. I mean, it may not be the same, but at least he's going to finish it, that I can assure you. Uh, he's also was my assistant private secretary when I was vice president. And um, he is my private secretary now when I'm not vice president. Um, so he has been assistant when I had a job and when I didn't have a job. He, he was a private secretary to a jobless man. Amen. You need faith for that. Amen. You, 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 need, you, you need to be called. You need to be called by God to be an assistant to a jobless man and, uh, and he's been a good assistant uh, in that regard and we have been together for a period of 20 years wow. serving in his office and so um, yeah anybody who serves and works with me for 20 years deserves to be honored because it's not easy my wife says um, yeah my wife thinks that uh, she was saying one day she said you know I wish all these girls who look at you with admiration can you can just give them a chance to be your wives just for a week. <laughs> then after a week, we have a, a conference discussion to, to get their feedback. Because that will be the last time they'll look at you because they're going to take off. It's, it's such a burden. To, yeah, yeah. I mean, when you watch something afar, you want it, right? <laughs> Until it's, it's in your hands. It's become a hot potato in your hands. So... Yeah, so we thank God for you. Clement, why don't you stand? Give him a Texas welcome. Amen. Clement, see you, Amen. 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 Thank you so much. You may be seated. Proud of him. But I'm also here with um, my close friend. Helps me around in the United States internationally. And he has been a friend for only 44 years. Not too long. Just 44 years. We went to the same high school in Zambia. At Hillcrest Technical Secondary School in Livingston. He's stationed here in the United States now. Married with great kids. And um, whenever I'm here, he's here for me. And um, I'm so glad that he has... He flew in yesterday just to be with me. Uh, Robert William from Pennsylvania... Please, just stand to your feet. Please welcome Robert William. Robert William from Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to talk about, but I won't give him the microphone because I know where he's going to go. <laughs> a great preacher of the word, and I'm just so proud of him. With an Indian descent. I call him Gandhi, he calls me Martin. It was never meant to be that way. So. And uh, there are many other sons that I have here today and daughters. One of them is uh, uh, David, although he, he, he flew in all the way from Florida to be with me. As he was my assistant also when, before he relocated to the U.S. He was my assistant. And uh, now he's here. He's done up, uh, David. Came in from Florida to be with us today. <laughs> One of my longest serving crusade managers served me to organize some of the most strategic, com complicated crusades. We entered Soweto where no black evangelist had a crusade there. Let me put it this white evangelist who used to go to South Africa could not preach in Soweto. First of all, they would be beaten up. Apartheid was strong and that was a black area and it was the only opportunity they had to revenge. So, white evangelists could not go there. And nobody was going there because you go there, they steal your stuff. Sound system. And we lost 
our combi that carried instruments, they just <laughs> took it, you know, and uh, you, you don't follow it up, you know, to get it because you may, you know, you know, you just let it go. Cause, but this crusade manager went into the most difficult places to introduce my ministry in, in the southern region. It was the only team I understand in the southern region that had a crusade ministry. I had 17 members of staff who said managers, intercessors, television crew, sound people. It was the first operation on the continent of evangelism outside Reinhard Bonk. And now my crusade manager is in the United States with his dear wife, Max and Bridget, stand to your feet and let everybody just welcome you today. Yeah. Organized our first and most difficult crusades. God bless you. We love you on the seed you sowed. The Lord will honor you. One of my longest serving secretaries also is here. She served in my office as a secretary for I don't know for how many years. Judith, can you stand? Judith served as my secretary Woo! in my office. And uh, she is here. Good to, good to have you. I didn't even know you were going to be here. Now you're all surprising me. Uh, I thought you were supposed to be in your churches. Doing what you're supposed to be. But I'm not through. Another precious couple that is here today. You know, when you look at what God can do through his word, it just blesses my heart. This young couple, you know, they have never really paid me for marrying each other because they joined me I, I brought them in separately and they came falling in love and becoming a couple and we have not discussed that yet but <laughs> Pauline was one of the most successful crusade soloists that the Lord ever gave me she placed the stamp of excellence anointing on my television broadcast Zambia shall be saved. Before I preach, she would hold that microphone and sing away. Every time she sang, I was ready to preach. The anointing was so heavy. A husband who was not the husband that time joined me. He was just doing his thing. Now he has become one of the best organ players that I've ever met. Even without singing, he can just play it and the anointing is there. And I'm not exaggerating. And this doesn't happen every day. So let me introduce my crusade soloist, Pauline Musonda, right there. Clarkson Musonda, the husband. And God has blessed them, blessed them, blessed them, blessed them. I love you. I love you. I love you. And they're out here in the United States doing their thing. And I'm so glad that... Um, so if I forget anybody, I also know that our vice president for the Zambia community is right here. Stand up. The Zambia community in Dallas is our vice president. So I'm so delighted uh, that we are all here. Are we ready for the word of God? I bring you greetings from my dear wife Florence, both Florence and myself graduates from Christ for the Nations. This is the place in which God commissioned me to go back to my country with the commission that you go and disciple your nation. It was out here in Dallas that he spoke to me as a young man of 24 years old. I graduated and went back and began to do what I've done by God's grace. And so this is a special place. So when I preach and the tear comes out, you know, once in a while, don't worry about it, just keep listening. It, just, it happens to me all the time. I'm a cry baby. I just love the Lord. I just, he's done so much for me that sometimes I try to be strong, but it's just not easy. It's just, it's been good. I, if you can see where I grew up, you would understand why I preach the way I preach. I have no reason to be here. No, not really. I don't have a reason to speak to you from here. But he, he made it possible. Um, so please these emotional feelings about the way I preach is 
just, just take it that this guy's got issues because God has done so much for him. Before I preach, Pastor, come here. The wife is not here. Yeah. Um, you know, when I, when the Lord called me to preach, this story you've told me about sleeping in my bedroom, you've never told me. <laughs> I'm very suspicious. <laughs> I see greenness and I want the church to hear me. This is your pastor. I see greenness. Greenness is newness, freshness, growth. The growth that will come to this church is not going to be the normal you add five, you add ten. There will be Amen. lips. Yes. Lips. Lips. There will be leaps. Almost to the extent that if you are 200, the next time you realize there's 400. It's not going to be, this is the greenness I'm saying. Now, I want you to listen to this. Please wait. God is saying something specific to you. And I want to say it. The, in Africa, dogs are very important. We don't have guns to protect ourselves usually. Dogs play that role. They guard us. They are the ones that provide security for us. But there's something that happens to dogs. In Africa, sometimes the economy is not that good. Sometimes we can't even feed our own children, let alone the dogs. So sometimes the home would go through a slump and there's enough food maybe for the family but not for the dogs. So the dog naturally begins to look around and leave the yard and start to find another house where there is food and starts to eat from there. The more it eats from there, it decides to stay and when an enemy comes to that house, it protects and defends that household at the expense of the other household. God said to me when I was a young preacher and he repeated to me when I was in the shower this morning to tell you, don't be distracted by people who shall envy your ministry. Whisper into your ears. Listen. Come with us. Be ours. This is what we'll give you. This is what we'll do for you. Your ministry is not for sale. It's not for sale. This ministry will grow. There's greenness. The Lord is saying to you, don't be distracted. Just grow. These are God's people. Amen. Our church was small when I started and it multiplied in leaps and bounds. But the Lord said three times to me, feed my sheep, feed Amen. my sheep, Amen. feed my Amen. sheep. Your focus should be these people. Amen. Feed the sheep. Listen. How do you feed the sheep? You grow the grass. Come on, come on. Just grow the grass. You can criticize any pastor, talk about any ministry. That's not what's going to grow this ministry. Come on. Just grow the grass. The sheep shall come. They will come from wherever there is no grass. They will come for feeding. And that's what I sense about you. Spend time. You know where to spend time. You are an African. You know where to spend time. We don't depend on anything else Amen. but what God gives to us. Amen. So Amen. if it's not God, it's not worth it. Woo! Yes. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this greenness I see in this ministry. The Lord is saying, grow grass. Spend time in his presence. Grow grass. And the sheep shall come. On their own. And you will not be able to hold them. There shall be not enough room for you to hold them. In Jesus name. 
Do not be distracted. Do not be distracted. In the name of Jesus. Lips and bounds. Lips and bounds. I thank you Lord. In Jesus name. And everybody shouted amen. amen. Give the Lord a big hand of praise. Glory to the Lamb. Glory, glory. God bless you. I feel so good about what God is doing in your life. You know, God bless you. You may be seated. You may be seated in God's holy presence. Paul, him do something. And yes. we're going to get into the word just now. Just do it. Trust in the
Thank you, Gladson, for leading and give the Lord that big hand of praise. He deserves it today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in God's holy presence. My assignment this morning comes from the book according to Brother John, chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to John's Gospel, chapter number 19. That's where my assignment for this morning is. And I'll start to read from verse 17, the book of John, chapter number 19. And I read from verse 17, if you have your Bibles. If you got the place, say amen. If you are ready to receive, say amen. If you've made up your mind to receive, say amen. amen. Wow. Amen. So you don't mind a politician preaching? Yeah. All right. That's okay. Let's go. Verse 17, John chapter 19. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, on either side one, and Jesus in the middle. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The writing on the cross in a great inscription of capital letters was Jesus Christ, the king of of the Jews. I, I don't want to go ahead of myself, but allow me to just make one statement before I continue to read. I'm not through yet. Pilate placed an inscription on the punishment cross of Jesus and called him a king. But you must be aware the reason he was hanging on that cross was because he claimed to be a king. And yet in his death, the authorities agree with his claim that he indeed he was a king. But they still killed him for claiming to be a king, which they later confirmed as king that they put him on what we would call his tombstone today. It's a bit confusing. I understand. The reason they charged him with treason was because he claimed to be king. How then can you kill him and on his tomb you write king? A bit confusing. And I know you're not with me yet, but I'm going to work on it. I, I have to work it out. I mean, I can't just expect you to join me at my excited level without doing my work. But I just wanted to put that line in there because I'm going to come back to it. How do they kill him for saying I'm a king? You should not have said you're a king. So we'll kill you for treason. And when they try to kill him and kill him, they say he truly is king. Okay, let's, let's leave it there. Because I think this might be complicated. Let me have to work it. The Bible says, verse 20, This title then read many of the Jews. For the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city. And it was written in the Hebrew, Greek, and in Latin. Three languages of that time. Almost everybody in that area spoke one of the three or all of them. Two or all of them. So it was a sure act that everybody must read that he was king. Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, do not write, now they are coming to themselves. Do not write the king of the Jews. Because that's why we brought him to you, to crucify him. You can go around confirming what you are saying. We submitted him to you, Pilate, so that you can kill him for claiming to be king. You can't go around writing on top of this cross that is king. Okay. So they said, don't write that he was the king, but that he said... I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. You know, in Zambia, 
In Zambia, when I reach this point, they'll go crazy. They just, it's like I've already preached. Because all of a sudden, Pilate gets involved and says, listen, folk, what I have written, I've written. And in those days, when a king decrees, you can't reverse it like that. It's done. He's king. I want to speak to you today on a message that I've entitled, The Power of Introduction. The reason why this has been critical to me over the past few years, I've developed this message over and over because I can't get over it. It's such an amazing story. Not too long ago, the Lord showed me that even at my very worst, in my spiritual walk, in my health, in the condition of my finances, in the condition of my marriage, or at the worst in all these areas, those problems I face, difficulties and lack, they really do not de describe who I am. They don't define who I am. They're ugly, but that's not who I am. They're really devastating, but that's really not who I am. And God says it so well as I proceed in this message. And that really healed me because our opponents, our enemies, give us the name of our lowest season. That's the name they'll give to you because they love it to see you fail to make it. So they give you the name of your ugliest condition. That's what they do. That's why you hear that blind Bartimaeus. We don't even know his first name. But they use his misfortune for his name. Some of you are carrying names that don't belong to you. Somebody has called you by some mistake that you did. And you are moving around with a mistake you committed 15 years ago. Well, today is another day. Because you shall be properly introduced. That's why I came all the way from Zambia because I'm tired of seeing God's people carrying names that are not theirs. The Bible calls him the paralytic man. But who is he? He had a name. He was paralytic. That's all the Bible says. And some of you are being called what you're not. Yes, you messed up. But you're not a mess. We are living in a world where people want to brand you so that they can feel better by you being a greater mess than they are. Have you ever been in a place where somebody introduces you? Oh, her name is Joyce. This is my friend Joyce. You remember the one who I told you about, the one who was divorced two years ago? What on earth are you? Is that the only thing that has happened in Joyce's life? But why do you hit on the divorce? Because they're trying to introduce you. Because listen church. The way you are introduced. Is the way you shall be perceived. And that's how people will relate to you. That's how your blessings will be stolen from you. Because people are going to. Oh Lord help me preach this morning. You are here. Carrying a name that's not yours. You're going to cast it down today. And I'm aware if you are like me, you messed up. In Zambia, we mess up real bad. That's why we need more of the blood out there. To cleanse us from all evil. But I am not a mess, although I messed up. And that's the message I bring to you today. You messed up. Things are hard. Friends will call you by those circumstances. But I've come to let you know you got another name. And that's the name I want to deal with today. And that I just love the way God looks at us. So I wanted to state this before I proceed that when I realized that even at my worst, that's not who I am. That doesn't define who I am. Yes, 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 yes. I, I messed up. No. What do you want to do with that? I messed up, but I can get out. I messed up, but I'm going to get out. But anyway, let me start to work my way towards the closure. 
of this message. Because if I don't start right, I may not end right. <laughs> now, introduction is everything. That's why you move with business cards. You are trying to impose who you are on someone you meet. It's extremely critical to carry your own credit, your own cards. Because if you don't carry one, somebody is going to print one for you. And this is my concern right here. You better. People are mean. They have got problems themselves. So they are not going to introduce you as somebody better than them. An introduction is a very criminal act. If done by a criminal mind. Because by introducing you a certain way, even the girl who wanted to marry you will change her mind. Just by a wrong introduction. That's why whenever I'm preaching somewhere and I'm being introduced and I think the introduction is not right, I always reintroduce myself. Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. I, I'm, no, 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 no. I'm not going to take any chances. You only have one shot. One shot. And if somebody introduces you, not, I, you may never have another time to clean up. Yeah, so I, I come over here and say, oh, no, 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 no. This is who I am. Oh, yeah, I'm not going to let you direct my path. Pauline sang that the Lord will direct your path. God looks at me differently. You know, this thing is very critical. And I allow me to preach my way through this sermon because I'm really seeing something. You know, Pastor, if you had wanted, Pastor Mwenya, today you could have introduced me any other way and you would have been 100% accurate. And you would not have sinned before God. I said, ladies and gentlemen, the man who is about to come and speak is a great speaker. He would be right, maybe. This man ran for president twice in Zambia. <laughs> and on both occasions, he failed dramatically. <laughs> so put your hands together as we welcome the losing, the twice losing presidential candidate. Please rise to your feet and let's welcome him. Now, the news is he would have been absolutely right. I stood for president twice and I lost. But that's not my name. Because the Bible says seven times you shall fall and seven times you shall rise. So you, you can't call me by a temporal setback. A temporal setback cannot be my name. My name is something that describes where I'm going. But your enemy will not give you the name of where you're going. Your enemy will give you the name of your challenges today. And I, I hope you understand now. I hope you understand where I'm going with this. So people will introduce you in the manner that when people look at you, oh, yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. But I'm going to stand up there and introduce myself. Here is the good news. Here is the good news. Here is the good news. When you, before you were born, God called you to be a king or a queen, but king, let me put it that way. He called you and that's, he's the only one who has the data, the information. He is the one who's got all the information on his disk of who you are before you were born. I don't believe you, Pastor Mumba. Well, turn with me to Jeremiah 1 and verse 5. All the, sp all the spiritual people that don't just want to hear a preacher or they want to see the Bible, turn with me to Jeremiah 1. The Bible says verse number 5. Oh, hallelujah to God. The Bible says, before I formed you in the belly of your mother, I knew you. Yes. How is that possible? How is it possible that 
The word used formed means that the, your father had not yet done anything. He was still out on a journey on, on duty. And, and God began to talk about you. That before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. How do you know something that is not formed? So go with me. Some of you cannot handle what I'm about to say because it's too much. It's too much. You, you, you Pentecostals, you don't like to get there. You, you, so, but I'm going to try to, to force you to go there. In other words, God knew you were there before your father did something sensible. He knew you. Let, let me finish that verse of scripture so that you know that. The Bible said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Then, before you came out, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So, as far as God is concerned, it's a done deal. Because it's not even, look, this is why I say to all these, from where I come from in Zambia, my tribe, men are very proud. When he has 10 children, he says, I am a man. <laughs> Look at the 10 children. But what did you do as a man? I would even give more respect to women than men. What, what did you do to claim that you're a man? <laughs> Just had fun and had children. That's all. It's the ladies that go through it. Come on. Okay, okay. Somebody says men should be asked, you know, at least to have one baby. They're not going to turn blue. They're going to die. <laughs> but the point I want to make, church, is that that scripture there is complete. In other words, God decided on you where he sits. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make somebody. Okay, I'll call him uh, when you and um, I want him to accomplish a certain purpose on my behalf. So in order for him to do that, I have to shape him in a way that he fits that part. And also, I'll make sure he's born in a place that will ensure that he carries out my assignment that I have in my mind. And also in order to him, for him to do it, I want him to have certain characteristics that are going to make him fulfill that dream and in order for that to happen it will need a man of this nature and dna and a woman of this nature and dna and if i concoct that i'll come up with a mwenya that can be born in somewhere like in in, in zambia maybe in the village but i am preparing him for the united states but in order for him to have a unique ministry i want to expose him to certain things that by the time he stands in texas so you were here before you were born now and i know this is complicated now okay 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 i know this is complicated but that's the truth he's god so you were here before you were born and then when God decides, and then I don't want him to be born in the 70s or in the 60s. I'll wait a little bit because I want him to live long enough to be able to finish the mission over the 20,000s. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. So the job of your preparation was already done in heaven. He, he knew you. He, before you were born, he sanctified you, set you apart. And then he goes on a search, on some Google search, to find a man with that DNA that will produce such kind of a guy. Then he finds your father. And this is why I want to encourage those of you that were born out of wedlock. And people have told you you're a mistake. No, 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 no. Not according to that scripture. No, 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 no. That scripture. 
That scripture cancels all that theology. That one says he knew you. So he knew that it's that drunk man in that tavern or in a beer hall. That's got what God needs for you. And that man is walking out of the beer hall drunk, sees a Susie on the street. And goes, Psst. I mean, they are not married. He just drunk. He's looking for some kind of night. And you church people, if you found him, you bind him and bind him as a promiscuous person. No, no, no. But God is at work. He doesn't care about your limited theology. He's looking for some DNA that God. I think this is too much. Let, let me slow down. This is, this is too much. This is too much. Anyway, listen. You understand what I'm talking, where I'm going with this, don't you? So God just moved on this guy and he felt it. You know, all these feelings we feel for women, for men, God is in control of it. One young man when I was in Kiro as a pastor comes to me and said, Pastor Mumba, pray for me. These sexual drives are killing me. Just kill them. I said, I said, you are a fool. I said, what do you mean? I said, if I kill them, when you get married, you come and kneel again and say, pray for me to come, for them to come back. I, is this a joke? Is this a joke? That today I kill them, then you come back, you line up so that you can have them. No, you're going to have them the rest of your life. Just know how to zip up your pants and hold strong until, until your season comes. Somebody say yes. So those feelings we have are not from the devil. No. I'm glad I've got them. Yeah. I got lots of them. That's how come I've got five children. So I'm a pastor, but I got five children. And I'm thankful to God for those drives. From God. Holy. Sanctified. So that guy who was in a beer place stumbles out of that place and finds Susie trying to also stumble into our car. I say, hey, Susie, how about a night out? <laughs> Susie looks at him and says, who are you? I said, you know, hi, baby, you know that you're really cool. And in drunken states, you can say a lot of things. And that girl said, okay, just for the night, right? Just tonight, right? Never again. And that is because he knew you. Without those two coming together, that scripture will be compromised. Oh, Lord, this is too much. Am I making sense? Am I making sense? So, in as far as God is concerned, he doesn't have a problem as to who you are. He knows you're a king. Because he made you a king before you were born. Amen. But the challenge that takes place is that the moment you are born, somehow the spirit world is one. The devil decided many years ago to rebel against God. And start his own kingdom to challenge God. So for some reason, the devil looks into the spirit world. And he's able to know that mm -mm, there's something on that life. That's why the Bible says, for the enemy hunteth for the precious life. How does he know the life is precious? How did he know the one to be born was Jesus? That they commanded that all children under two years should die. Because the enemy is able to smell destiny. The devil knows. That's why some of the most spiritual, some of the most gifted, some of the most given to God people have more trouble than those of you that are just kind of hanging around on a borderline. Because he can deal with you later. There's nothing much there. But those that are 100% dedicated to God, when the devil hits, he gets all the army of evil. Because he knows if we let this one go, America shall be saved. If we let this one go, Zambia shall be saved. So he marks him and marks him and marks him and marks him. Every day there is trouble in his life. 
And two believers say there's a problem with him. He's not walking with God. How come there's so many misfortunes in his life? God is against him. He's living in sin. No, he's not. His life is marked. No, no, don't let them convince you that you're out of the will of God. The more you love God, the more devils are assigned to you. Zambia produced one of the best players in soccer on the continent. In fact, in 19 something, 94, 84, he was the footballer of the year. 1984, Africa, Kalushabwaria. Now, every time he plays, I cannot avoid laughing because before the game starts, the other team first discusses Kalusha. So how are we going to deal with him? I want you, coach is telling them, I want the four of you, the whole game, your eyes must be on him. <laughs> Everyone has got one marker, but Kalusha four. Why? Because he's the most dangerous guy on the pitch. And if you let him go through, he was number nine. And if you let him go through without fail, he had the ball in the, behind the net. So in order to stop him from scoring, you have to stop him. The devil operates the same way. When he sees you are going somewhere, he blocks you. He fights you. Where other people only have one demon fighting them, you have six. In fact, the Bible says seven. I'm trying to stop you. I don't want to miss you here because my message is slightly different. My message is he knew you. And the more God starts to prepare you, the enemy wants to prove to you you are not what God says you are. So that's why the Bible says, whose report will you believe? I believe the report of the Lord. Why? Because from the moment you are born, the enemy is trying to convince you, you are not a prophet. You are not a king. You are not the in guy. The whole time, the fight is on. And that's why I've come here to let you know, whipping men do it for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Your call is complete. You are called by God and you are destined to succeed. But God allows you. He allows the enemy to hit you. It happened to Job when the devil came and said, so you think Job saves you because he loves you? No, it's because you protected him. and You just open up for me just one day. He's going to curse you. And God said, go ahead. You know, there comes a time when God becomes proud of you that he sets the enemy against you. When you reach that level, then you are in another world. When God can have a, a bragging day over your life. Oh yeah, you want to touch him? You go ahead. Give it a shot. Come back and tell me how far you go with John. Or with Job. And he went out there and did everything you can imagine in a short space of time. Lost his wealth, lost his family, lost his kids. He now had sickness from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. The time now was there for him to curse God. But he said something else. Though you slay me, yet will I bless you. That word. He knew that he was known before he was conceived. Weeping men do for a night, but joy comes in the morning. If God said it in the beginning, he shall truly bring it to pass. It's the job of the enemy to stop you. To try to intimidate you. Discourage you. Make you give up. That's God's job. I know somebody's thinking, come on, Mr. Politician, give us some policies. This is the best policy I can give you right now. <laughs> policy number one is that God knows you. That should make you walk a certain way. When you know that God knows me, then I know that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Because God fights the battle for me. He knows me by name. Oh my God. God, I feel like preaching. Because somebody here is being told a lie. 
Just because of what you've gone through, the divorce you went through, you think you are not of God? You think that it's over for you? You know why all those attacks have come on your life? You are such a special seed. You are such a special seed. And if you're not being attacked enough, maybe you're not. So don't misinterpret your tears for being ungodly. The Bible says weeping shall endure for a night. Not may shall endure for a night. You're going to cry. I don't know how many times I have cried. My life has been from one challenge to the other. Jail, prison. Betrayal, rejection. Broke, insulted. Forgotten, abandoned. Mistreated, belittled. Every other day. Until some people say to me, never give it up. Come on, come on. It's never meant for you. Come on. The presidency of Zambia is not for you. It's for the non-believers. It's not for men of God. Just let it go. You have no prison time and you have no tears. The devil whispers quietly. But listen, there could be a problem in the devil's mind. That look, uh, if I don't do this job well and discourage this gentleman, what if he slips through and becomes president? What's going to happen to my kingdom? Because now he is going to lift his hand and say, this nation belongs to God. So, so before he does that, before, before he does that, before he does that, let me stop this thing. So let me, if I can kill him, I would rather kill him. Not too long ago, I was thrown in the maximum prison for 12 days. I was telling Max, my crusade manager, when I was coming to the U.S., he was, they were trying to do my... My CV, I said, have you got any new inclusions on your biography so that we can give it to the pastor? I said, yes, I do, yes, yes. Just, just came out of jail. Put there that uh, I'm a convicted criminal, felon. He said, no, 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 let's leave that out. I said, no, 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 no. It's part of it. Don't worry about it. But no, 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 because for the world, when you go to jail, you're a criminal. Nelson Mandela was a criminal. Paul in the Bible was a criminal. Joseph in the Bible was a criminal. Daniel was a criminal. A lot of criminals out there that I love. So, so just put it there. It's part of the pathway. And this is why I have a problem with pastors today who feel that going to jail is a problem when Paul didn't think so. In fact, Paul could not imagine a man of God not being imprisoned. Because when you preach, you're preaching another kingdom. And kings, kings don't like to hear about other kings. At least not in the same territory. So that's why preachers get into trouble. Because they talk about another authority, another allegiance to another king and another kingdom. That frustrates the sitting president. Because he wants all the loyalty to him. But if you say, but there is somebody greater than kings. They used to chop them, their heads off in the Bible. So the point I'm, I've made after all this talk this morning. Is to let you know that God already knows who you are. The devil knows who you are. And the job of the devil is to stop you so that you don't get there by discouraging you. I don't know 
the late McCain that much. I'm not an American. As Africans, we read about him. Extremely controversial. Extremely controversial on matters. But he's fought this life in his own way, following a certain path. And I respect him for that. He may not be a pastor, but if pastors fail to stay on what's not popular, pastors preach popular messages. Because they don't want to go to jail, first of all. <laughs> Two, they don't want to lose tithers. So they navigate their messages around money, against prison, and popularity. So they preach messages that are really not helping people because the messages that help people sometimes are brutal. You know, these doctors are mean. I mean, they'll tell you, you know what, I love you, but what I'm going to do is going to hurt. They're going to give it to you right there. No, 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 I don't want anything that hurts. Then you get out of here because you go die. Because in order for you to leave, it's going to hurt. Are you ready for it? Close your eyes. That's the preaching that's going to save you. And I'm saying, church, what's coming is going to hurt. But just, just, just be still. I know that I'm God. I love you enough to let it hurt. So some of you, there's pain in your lives. But I'm here for you this morning. I'll pray for you this morning. Now, I'll give the story of Jesus, then I'll pray for you today. Jesus was king from the beginning. It was in the prophecies. He was already king. The Bible says he was manifested a long time ago. Then he was born in John 1.1. 1, 1. He came in the flesh and dwelt amongst men. Coming from where he pre-existed. So he was there before. Then he took up flesh to be like us and manifested in the flesh. But that doesn't mean that was his first entry into life. It was his first entry into the atmosphere. But he had always been there. The same with you. So, here is the point. From the day Jesus was born, even before he was born, the enemy was ready for him. Because they, they, their own seers had smelt him. Stargazers had seen him in the stars. Witches had seen him. They knew exactly where he was going to be born. They knew around the time he was going to be born. And the counselors to the kings were seers, witches. People who could see the spirit world. So they said, you know what, king? There's another king about to be born. They didn't understand about Savior and Jesus. They just could see there's a king coming. So they said, can we approximate around what time? And they gave him approx approximate dates and times. And then you know what happened? He made a decree that anyone below the age of two should be killed in the hope that the savior or the king being born will die. So they know these things. So I thought that before I close, it is important to understand that Jesus Christ was rejected before he was born. Joseph, the husband of Mary, had a real issue with a pregnant Mary. His own father rejected him. He said, look, I'm, the Bible says, as he was contemplating on divorcing Mary, God had to intervene and send an angel for the angel to plead with him. Look, we got to keep this clean. We know that you, you didn't play a part, but just for the purpose of the purposes of God, can you just die to self and just pause like you are the father? Please. There is a purpose here. But he was rejected. But his own father said, I am my baby. And men know when they, although you guys don't think we know, we know it's not mine. I mean, you can give it to us, but it, we know in our hearts, God help me, it's not mine. And Joseph knew that, come on, look. Mary, with all due respect, explain when. When, when, when. 
But the angels had to intervene to just calm him down. So he was rejected before he was born. When he was born, he was rejected by the society. He didn't even have a place to be born. A reject who could not be born in a hospital because there was no hospital bed. So he was born amongst animals. What kind of entry into the world is that? What kind of rejection is that? Your own father rejects you. The world you're born in rejects you. It was a series of rejections. Before birth, at birth, at the height of his ministry, he was called a drunkard, demon possessed. He was called like he was out of his mind, rejected by his own. A man of sorrows, the Bible says in the book of Isaiah. Acquainted with grief. His life was not beautiful. He never spent time in the Hilton Hotel. Having cocktail. No. He was always fighting one battle or the other. Rejected by society. To the extent that when time came to be accused, they accused him of treason. For saying what you have said is, is the truth. That's what he said. They said, are you the king of the Jews? He said, you have said it. And they said treason. And he was mistreated and taken for treason. And not only was he rejected in that area of justice, but also when an election came to elect between Barabbas and Mr. Jesus, there were only two on the ballot. Jesus and the criminal Barabbas. Listen to this. This is amazing. This has comforted me because, you know, when I lost those two elections, I realized I was not the first one to lose them. If Jesus lost by a major landslide, Barabbas the criminal who had just killed people stood out there laughing and said, yeah, now you vote between me and that guy. And the vote went in the favor of Barabbas. Jesus lost the election and was crucified. A man of sorrows. What a name. But all these things, as he was being rejected, Jesus, God knew that my time to introduce my son will come. And this is my message. Oh, with all that you've gone through, with all the pain that you've gone through, there is a day that God strategizes. Where it will be undisputable. Nobody can doubt that you are the king of kings. Can I preach this morning? Can I preach this morning? Sit down. Let me explain now. Here is the point. God has seen your afflictions. He has heard your cry. He has seen your pain. He has seen how people have misunderstood you. How they have laughed at you. Thrown you into jail. Accused you falsely. Stolen from you. God has been watching. And your tears have been spared in a bottle. And God won't act until the bottle is full. So now when the bottle starts to get full. Then God begins to strategize. For a grand introduction. Now. To the enemy. When God is fixing to introduce you, he thinks he's winning. Come on, come on, come on, come on. He uses the entire justice system to rise up against Jesus. They make sure that they abrogate their own law in order to crucify Jesus. You know, they had options to discipline Jesus, but they decided the most cruel death in order to deal with him. But they didn't know that the more cruel the death was, the more glorious his introduction is. When people rise up against you, when people want you destroyed, they think so evil. They want to finish you off, not only you, but your children and your children's children. They plan evil. The Bible says, be still. I know that I'm God. 
Weeping men do it for a night. But joy comes in the morning. Let them scheme. Let them plan. Let them strategize. Let them go all the way. Because the harder they come, the harder they fall. God is fixing. God is fixing to strategically introduce you. Watch, watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. In haste, in anger, in a judgmental spirit, they decide to meet out a death on the cross. Let's follow the events. What do they do? Let's use the cross. It was only used for criminals, murderers, the worst type. They said, instead of using any other way, let's use this to teach them a lesson. So, they used the cross to elevate Jesus from the ground. Because when God is preparing for a major media blitz that's going to reach the whole world, he needs to use prime time. God takes us, hear me. God had to wait for the Super Bowl and get airtime right in the middle of the Super Bowl prime time so that the entire United States is watching because God doesn't do things in secret when he wants to introduce you he pays all the bills for that prime time it may look ugly when it's being done but he knows why he's taking this it may look like you're being ashamed publicly but he's fixing to introduce you the cross Means that they're not just going to dump him into a grave. They've got to elevate him on a tree so that you can see him. Then they decide where they're going to crucify him. Guess what? On a hill. Let's go to Golgotha. So that they can see him. On a tree. On a hill. Then the Bible says where they crucified him. Three roads crossed. All of them coming from different directions getting into Jerusalem. You could not get Jerusalem except coming through there. So this little road comes by Golgotha and they get into the gates. By Golgotha and they go towards the gates. So wherever you come from, there's a chance that you're going to pass by the hill of Golgotha. Then God in his wisdom takes it even further. He commands Pilate, who is his servant. Because the Bible says the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. Then Pilate says, write it on his cross. In Hebrew, Greek, and what's the other one? And Latin. What, what, what is going on here? You guys who just read the Bible, just oh, Latin, Greek, yeah, Hebrew. No, no, this was a strategy from heaven. Because he wanted everybody to read it. First of all, they had to deal with the fact that they couldn't go into Jerusalem except they passed by Golgotha. Step number one. Step number two, they could not miss it because... The cross was on a hill. They had to look up. And then even when they looked at, they had to read that that is the king of the Jews. Now, when Jesus, fast forward, when Jesus rose from the dead, he started a journey to Emmaus, found two chaps discussing some event. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? Then they answered him. This is how I know that God did good publicity. They said, are you the only one in Jerusalem? Who does not know the events of the last week? How that one by the name of Jesus was wrongly arrested 
and wrongly crucified. And what the information we're receiving on our CNN feed is that he's risen. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the God that I serve. You may be going through the pain now, but there is an introduction that God is setting up for you. There is a hill on which you're going to be placed. There is a cross on which you're going to be hung. And there is a language that will be understood because God is about to honor you. When your enemies come to you and to the authorities and said, change it. Say that he claimed to be the king. The king would answer what I have written. I have written. Give the Lord a big hand of praise somebody. <laughs> Father in the name of Jesus. I want to thank you that there is a day that is looming right now. A day in the coming. Which is coming. In which you are going to lift up your, your daughter. You're going to lift up your son. You shall wipe away their tears. Lord God, it may appear like they're abandoned now. It may appear that life is against them now. But I want to thank you that, Lord, may that day come soon. In the name of Jesus. The Bible says the stone which the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. And I want to say to you today, what I've tried to tell you this morning is that all the tears that you have shared, all the challenges you've gone through, he has watched them. In Exodus 3 it says, I've seen your affliction. I've heard your cry. I've heard your cry. All of you that are here, God has personally heard your cry. He has heard your cry. And now he says, I'm come down to deliver you. Myself. I'm not going to send no angel. I'm not going to send nobody. I'm coming down myself to deliver you. And I know that life can be complicated. But I qualify to preach. I've seen it all. I've seen the hatred of man. I've seen the vengeance of man. But I'm still standing. By his grace, you shall make it. There is a day coming just for you. And I came here to assure you that just hang in there a little longer. Just, just, just hang in there a little longer. Just, just, just hang in there a little longer. Pauline and Gladys will come here. I just feel that we need to give God a little bit of time. I know that some of you cannot believe what you've gone through and that it can ever change. I stand here to let you know it's about to change. And when God fixes to change it, it will happen so fast. And people will come to you and say, no, it's not right for her. But when God has done it, he says, what I have written, I have written. What I've decided over your life, I have decided. I'm not going to reverse it. You are blessed. Fully blessed. What you didn't have yesterday, you're going to have it today. Where you couldn't go yesterday, you'll go tomorrow. Because things have changed today. Every eye closed. Hallelujah. Every eye closed. Lift your hands toward God. Let's welcome Him. Hallelujah. Let's welcome Jesus. Here. For the Lord God yes, Lord, we understand. We understand that. We understand that it's not over, Lord. Hallelujah. We understand. We understand now. It's not over yet. Hallelujah, Jesus. We understand. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. 
him the praise. He's here tonight, today. He's here. Worthy is the Lamb. He's what? Worthy is the Lamb. You are holy. Hallelujah, Jesus. Holy. Holy, 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 holy. somebody in the house before I pray for the sick there's somebody in the house that you've never really prayed to receive Jesus in your heart as your personal savior what I've been talking about may be alien to you because you've not made that personal decision listen there's coming a day when you're going to die it's important that when you die you're sure that you're going to his presence and if there's any speck of doubt I want you to raise your hand and say Pastor Momba, I want to be sure that I'm on God's side. Lift that hand. I want to pray for you. Wherever you are, say, I just want to make sure that I'm on God's side. God bless you, sir. Anybody else? You say, pray for me, Pastor Momba. I want to make sure that Jesus is Lord of my life. Just raise your hand and join our brother here. Anybody else? You say, I just want to make sure that I'm walking with God. I will take no chances. Anybody else? I just want to make sure that we all are safe. Come over here, my brother. Come, come, come quickly. Anybody else who wants to join my brother? You say, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. And I want to pray for you. You are not ashamed of Jesus Christ. You want to serve him. There comes another. Anybody else? You are saying, I'm coming home. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Keep coming. Anybody else? You want Jesus in your life. Keep coming. This is your moment. This is your day. This is your season. There you come. God bless you. God bless you, my sister. God bless you. Anybody else? You want to make sure Jesus is Lord of your life. Please keep coming. Let's just sing it hallelujah one more time as we wait for somebody else to come and say yes to Jesus. Is there anybody else in the house? You want Jesus to be Lord of your life. I did this some 44 years ago. For 40 years ago, I gave my life to Jesus. And if you're here today, you can come and I'll pray for you today. Glory to the Lamb. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. For the Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. Anybody else? Anybody else? God. Glory to God. Anybody else? Choosing Jesus is a task. But it's a glorious task. When you choose Jesus, when people are watching, it makes heaven happy. If you can choose him before witnesses, it makes him happy. And if you're out there, you want to choose Jesus, come and join us here today. Come and join these people that have made that decision. Yeah. Holy. Yes, you are holy, Jesus. Holy. I want those of you that have come to the front to lift your hands. The rest of the church, stretch your hands toward these four people. What a day, what a glorious moment when people make a deliberate choice to follow Christ. They said, listen, I don't know how it's all done, but I've heard the word today and I've made up my mind to make Jesus Lord of my life. What a glorious day this is. You remember this day. Your children and your children's children will be connected to this decision. It's an inheritance not only for you, but for your children. I want the church to pray with them as they pray the sinner's prayer. The four of you want to pray as loudly as you can. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God. I accept that I'm a sinner. I departed from you. I lived a bad life against your word but this morning 
I've heard your word. And I repent of my sin. I ask you to, uh, to forgive me. Wash me in your precious blood. I want to be your child from this day forward. In Jesus' name, I am free. I am free. I am free. In Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you may touch these your people who have made a choice. I pray that you may keep them in the custody of your love and in the custody of your power. They shall never, ever be the same again. In Jesus' name, give the Lord a big hand of praise for this. We want, where do they go? I want this folk, come, come, please, before you sit down, come, 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 before you sit down. Just, I just need a few minutes of your time. I want you to follow my brother. Is that what it is? Where, where are they going to go? Where are you going to take them? Through there? Please. Yeah, you just talk to somebody there and uh, the chapel will. Give the Lord a big hand. Please give them that. <laughs> Hallelujah. While we are still in this attitude and atmosphere of prayer, I want you to look at me just for a few moments. The same God that saved you from sin, the same God that has kept you all these years, is able to heal your condition. You know, when I was at Christ for the Nations, I got to tell this story. Africans have a problem. They have many problems. But one of the problems Africans have is that when it comes to God, their job is not to investigate theology. Hebrew and Greek. They don't have patience for that. I mean, not that they don't want it, but they just, they've got needs. They've got issues that need to be met. So you can't confuse them in Greek and, and all that stuff. They just want, does this thing work? I mean, if it works, I mean, because I, I don't, you know, you talk to me about the Greek letter. Right now, my family is falling apart. I'm dying from stuff and I need some power that can get me out. While you're arguing theology, you're arguing Greek, we got to get some needs met. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I went to Christ for the Nations. During break, we used to go to the prayer room and start to pray. And then uh, as I was praying, I just felt a friend of mine tapping me on my shoulder. and said, shut up. Stop shouting. God is not deaf. What's wrong with you Africans? So I said, okay. He's an American friend. So he could say that because we were close. But he was really getting irritated. Because I was just going. I mean, it was like a motorbike at high speed. He said, excuse me. We all want to pray. Shut up. He should have been more Christian. But I didn't care. I had problems. Man, I had problems. I said, look, uh, I'll do my best. So I started to pray a little bit, you know, silently. And then I burst out. Not only shouting, but tears. Then after a while, he holds my hand, feeling sorry for me. He said, you know what, Nevers? Forgive me. I'm so sorry. I was a little bit hard on you. But you know, I understand. You Africans have problems. He said, look, me an American, all right? When I get sick, I call my doctor. Okay? And I'm insured. So they come and fix me, you know? When I'm broke, I talk to my banker. And, you know, they look at my credit and they're going to give it to me. When I want to buy a house, I don't have to have cash. I just need to have earnest money, you know, a little bit of it, give it to them, and I own a house. If I want a car, I don't have to work until I raise the $30,000. I, I can go get a vehicle for, for 500 bucks and I'll be paying on it, okay? So we don't have your problem. So I'm really sorry that I had to interrupt because for you guys, for anything to eat, you need to pray. To go anywhere, you need to pray. I said, yeah, that's the kind of God I want. I am not. I, I said, I don't envy you. If everything is on your fingertips, I don't envy you. I need to have a place where I can call on God. On. And so today, I don't know what it is that you're going through. All I can say is that God lives. By the fact that, listen, what's your name, Mina? By the fact that you woke up this morning 
and you didn't sleep all. That in itself is a miracle. Others slept all. But you know, you shook yourself up this morning. Looked around, you could feel yourself and you made your way to church. What, what greater miracle could there be? Because when you are sleeping, you are dead. So you got a cancer and the devil whispers to you that he can't heal it. He can't heal it. And yet he woke you up this morning. Did you engineer that? It's as simple as that. Jesus even simply simplifies it more. He says only believe. Meaning it's really that simple. Only believe that your cancer shall go to them. here. These big diseases and small diseases are in our heads. This is where we struggle. Okay, this is a headache God can heal. Cancer? No. It's too complicated because my doctor says there are so many cells that go wild and they are moving all over the place. It's not possible for me to be healed. So for cancer, no. But you know, headache, God can do it. Do you know that that's an insult? He made the whole thing. Including the cells that have gone wild. He made them. He can say peace be still to those cells. <laughs> to an African. The Bible only says only. Believe. And I want to work with those of you. That want to only. Believe. You're sick in your body. And you need God to do it. Come right now. But I want you to only. Believe. Don't come with your doctor's report and start to argue with me. Just believe that Dr. Jesus is in the house. I don't know what your condition is. Only Every hand raised toward heaven. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Sweep over us, Holy Spirit. I am the Lord your God that healeth thee. And I want you to prepare to receive your miracle. He's here already. He is here already. Just like he was there by your bedside this morning to tap you on your shoulders. God is here. I want to bring you into his confidence this morning. Don't look at the size of your problem because that's going to obstruct you. Don't, don't, don't think so much about what you've gone through. Just realize that God is here. He's here. And guess what? He loves you enough to heal you this morning. to the Lamb of God. I'm going to speak life over you this morning. I'll speak life over you this morning. And something is going to happen from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. There's an anointing that is already flowing here today. In the mighty name of Jesus. There's an anointing that is about to flow through your body. He made it. He created it. He knows it. And he's going to do it this morning. Heavenly Father, reach out. Your healer. Let's believe it. He sent his word. 
With those hands, the power of God is all over you, lady. The power of God is all over you. Healing you now. Now in Jesus' holy name. To the glory of God. In Jesus' name. Touch. Touch this lady, Lord. Touch this lady. Touch this lady, oh God. Touch this lady. As I place my hand upon you, the power of God is touching you. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Jesus, the power of God is all over you, lady. And healed your disease. Yes, Jesus. Touch, touch, touch. My Holy Spirit, that sickness is gone. That condition is gone. In Jesus' name. That condition is gone. In Jesus' name. Glory to the Lamb of God. We give you praise. We're doing the name of Jesus. I now release that anointing of healing upon you. That spirit, that spirit that has held on to this body. I rebuke you and I command you to be gone in Jesus' name. I declare you healed in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you may touch Priscilla from the crown of her head to the soles of her feet. Healing in Jesus' name. Make a whole now. In all the power of God is all over you. Young lady, in Jesus' name, touch this lady in Jesus' name. Now, to the glory of God. In Jesus' holy name. Touch in Jesus' holy name. Father, touch this young lady. For the glory of your name. Listen to me. Something is going on here. Someone's life has just been prolonged. Just now. Someone's life has just been prolonged. I don't know who that is. And I want you, listen. From now on, you are just going to, just, you, you just maintain what God has done for you. Stay in the word, stay in faith. Come here, come here, come here. Let, let, let these three come to the front right here. And, and you come as well. This lady, you come as well. What do you want, God? Father God, lift your hands. He has heard your prayer. I stand here as his servant and release that healing anointing. Every cell must line up with the word of God. Lord, I stand here as your servant and I decree life upon this lady. You shall live a full life. You shall live and not die. In Jesus' name. My God, my God, what's the condition? boy God has a plan for, for him he shall live in the name of Jesus in fact what's going to happen although he had a delayed thing he's going to speak very fast he's going to be a fast speaker faster than, he, faster than the preacher for today I speak it and I create with these words life for you in the name of Jesus I place my hand upon this little boy and Lord I thank you for showing him favor in Jesus name for the glory of God it is done what do you want God to do for you? Father in the name of Jesus I breathe life over this young lady she shall live and not die in Jesus name from now on, the Lord has touched you and healed you in Jesus' holy name. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask of you to put your arms around my brother right now and let the healing virtue go through his body. In Jesus' name, you have been made whole. Amen. Father, God, I breathe life over him now. 
in the name of Jesus every vein every artery is open right now in Jesus name it is done Jiva, wherever you are, you are coming back home. Jiva, you are coming back home now. Wherever you are, you are hearing this voice. You are coming back home to your father. In Jesus' name, it is done to the glory of God. Jiva is coming back home. Give the Lord a big hand of praise. Somebody praise him. I want us to worship God just for a few moments. I'm handing over the microphone to the pastor. But listen. The Bible makes it extremely simple. Only believe. From now on, walk in that healed condition. He has done it.